The pandemic has tossed a curveball at just about everything in society, including our utilities. For big companies like PSEG, a lot of decisions have been made and still need to be made about the day-to-day -day operations and much more, including keeping the energy flowing even when families cannot afford their bills right now. President and CEO Ralph Izzo spoke to Rhonda Shackler about that and more. Ralph Izzo, President, CEO, and Chairman of PSEG, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for having me, Rhonda. It's great to see you. You know, of course, all across the state, our companies have been impacted by COVID-19. How has the pandemic impacted you at PSEG, and how are you still able to keep your capital plan intact during these very difficult times? Yeah, we're no exception, Rhonda. We've been affected in numerous ways. Uh, operationally, of course, having to change some of our work practices. I won't bore you with the details of that, but trying to not mix crews, making sure that half of the workforce that is capable of working from home is doing so. So there's been a whole slew of operational effects. It's made keeping the capital program going a little bit more of a challenge, but thank goodness for the talent of our employees, they're able to do that. It's also had an effect on us financially. Our customer payment patterns are off. Our receivables are twice what they would normally be at this time because of the economic impact it's had on our customers, who of course we have tremendous empathy for and are eager to work with them to help them uh, find their way out of this challenge. Uh, and we do of course have, uh, the governor asked for a moratorium on utility shutoffs. So I'm assuming um, once that get ends, uh, there'll be some sorting out on that end too. That's, that's correct, Rhonda. We, we actually, and of course, Governor Murphy was right to call for that. Uh, I don't mean to pat us on ourselves on the back, but we, we volunteered to do that even before any such announcement was made. But nonetheless, uh, the, the governor is always concerned about uh, those who are less fortunate than others and their ability to make ends meet. But your point is an important one. Uh, people shouldn't misconstrue a moratorium with the forgiveness of payments. So we are encouraging customers to contact us so we can help them to help themselves. There are government programs that are available to assist with, uh, with bill payment and things of that nature. Right? We don't want folks to dig such a hole that it becomes a long-term project to get out of it. And, and, and of course, we'll work with them. We, we fully understand the circumstances that they're faced with. So you are at the same time preparing for the future and part of your capital plan has to deal with modernization, has to do with resiliency. How is this going to translate into service improvements for your customers? Well, you know, what motivates us is sustainability. And sustainability comes across in at least three, if not many, many more dimensions. It's environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and how we govern ourselves. So we're looking at all kinds of improvements, as you said, replacing equipment that's literally 100 years old and has done more for us than we should have ever expected it to do for us, as well as investing in new technology that can improve the customer experience. Many customers find it hard to believe that today, even with today's technology, if their service is interrupted, we don't know that unless they call us. So we're, we're working with the Board of Public Utilities to change that technology so that, so that we know before a customer calls us that they're out of service. And we're working on improving the quality of our pipes and our wires so that we don't leak natural gas so that our electrical grid is more resilient in the face of major storms. We are greatly motivated by our fundamental belief that climate change is real and we need to uh, do things to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. But given the trajectory we're on as a society, we also need to adapt to it to a certain extent. You know, this push toward clean energy, which really our, our whole state, the governor is trying to move forward and PSE and GE has a whole host of plans on this front. Um, and one of the things I think that gets a little underreported is uh, the clean energy job story. I know that you are planning uh, to hire pretty significantly once things really get rolling. You're so right there as well, Rhonda. My favorite topic, and it's one that very rarely gets attention, is what I call energy efficiency. And, and due to the governor's leadership and the Board of Public Utilities embracing of his agenda, we were just granted approval to, to invest a billion dollars, $1 billion over the next three years in energy efficiency. And I call that the quadruple winner. As you pointed out, we think that's gonna to lead to the creation of over 4,000 jobs. So it helps the economy. Number two, the cleanest energy uh, that you can 
produce is the one that you don't, is the kilowatt hour you don't use, right? So we're gonna protect the environment by having people use less electricity and natural gas. Customer bills will go down as a result of this. We estimate a net savings of $1 billion, It'd be a gross savings of two and a half billion dollars, but we're gonna to have to invest some money to achieve that savings. So the net benefit is a billion. And because of the way in which the Board of Public Utilities designed it, it's an investment we're eager to make so our shareholders can win. So we have shareholders winning, customers winning, the environment winning, and new employees winning. It's just, but unfortunately it doesn't get the attention that some of the more glamorous projects did, right? Installing light bulbs are not as exciting as solar farms. Uh, installing programmable thermostats maybe isn't as glamorous as offshore wind, but it's every bit as important. So one thing that has gotten a lot of attention lately is a request for ratepayer subsidies for your nuclear operations. You're awaiting a word from the BPU on that. As you know, some groups are challenging that again. How does the nuclear operations, how do they fit in with the future of energy in our state? Yeah, so, so that unfortunately, we're going to work real hard to educate people on that. If you look at nuclear power, the, the challenge is the fact that fossil fuel generators are allowed to produce electricity without paying for the cost of the carbon that they emit. Now we, we, we compensate for that with renewables by subsidizing them far more than we subsidize nuclear. And, but that's because nuclear had been a relatively low cost supplier until natural gas prices plummeted as a result of the fracking that occurs in the Ohio and Western Pennsylvania region. So nuclear does not have the benefit of getting away with not paying for its burden associated with what it candidly is pollution in the form of carbon, which benefits fossil, and it doesn't have the subsidies of wind and solar. And those subsidies dwarf anything we're asking for for our nuclear plants. So nuclear loses out on both ends. If you look at what it means to subsidize nuclear, it's the equivalent of what uh, the, the units are $10 per megawatt hour. You compare that to rooftop solar, which is subsidized to the tune of over $200 per megawatt hour. And you compare that to offshore wind, which is subsidized to the tune of $60 per megawatt hour. So nuclear is relative to those two, a very inexpensive technology to keep people working, to keep power prices relatively low, and to keep the environment clean but it's not well understood by the public and it's our responsibility to help educate them. Well, Lisa, thank you for educating us on everything that's been going on with the company. We really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you for having me again, Rhonda. Thank you.